for more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch and our new show Dispatches from the Congo where we're going to be talking about on a bi-weekly basis the key issues that are happening in the country, its impact both on the region and globally, as well as the kind of struggles, the social movements and the aspirations of the youth in this very significant country in Africa. We have with us Kambale Musawli. Thank you so much, Kambale, for joining us. Thank you. And I want to start, to start out with a very important issue, which is on all of our minds these days. The Monday, that is the 17th of January, is the 60th anniversary of the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. January 17th marks the 60th anniversary of the brutal assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the iconic leader of the Congo's struggle for independence and the country's first Prime Minister. Lumumba was and remains a hero throughout the world for his role in the anti-colonial struggle, his belief and work in Pan-Africanism and his vision of a decolonized state. Lumumba's beliefs, his policies and his very existence were a threat to the imperial powers. Just months after he had assumed office, the CIA, Belgium and their allies in the country masterminded the operation that led to his brutal murder. He was 35 years old. They hoped to silence him, but Lumumba has lived on in the hearts and minds of the people across the world, and most importantly, in their struggles. Today, we try to understand what makes Lumumba such an icon, what made him so dangerous to imperialist powers, and how his legacy endures to this day in the Congo and the struggles of the people there. So could you maybe start off by talking a bit about how his legacy is viewed today in the Congo, the kind of inspiration he provides, how he's seen, especially by the youth and progressive movements today? Patrice Lumumba was the first elected, uh, democratically elected uh, prime minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, he comes from a long history of resistance, uh, not just from him uh, as a uh, I would say an activist or a militant, uh, but the struggle of Congolese to determine their affairs since the 1400. Um, the 1400, we had the Portuguese come. Uh, later, we had the uh, King Lopo come in the 1800 during the carving up of the African continent. And Congolese have always resisted. So he symbolized the spirit of resistance that Congolese have embodied for over 400 years. Um, but Patrice Mumba also represents what what is the possibility of what Pan-Africanism can do on the African continent? Um, as we discuss even his work and him becoming prime minister of the DRC, we have to know that this did not happen in a silo. And it happened with the support of other Africans from Chad, from Cameroon, from Ghana, and uh, from Central African Republic. So all these Africans fought to see a free and liberated Congo. Now that he's dead, uh, brutally killed uh, with the help of the CIA and Belgium, uh, Belgium, and of course, a few Congolese sycophants, uh, we can say that his ideas have not been killed. So they killed Patrice Lumumba physically, but they could not kill his ideas. And his ideas were, were uh, very simple. He wanted the Congo to be controlled by the Congolese. He wanted the resources of the Congo uh, to benefit the Congolese people. And because of that ideal of control of the land and resources and produce, uh, ex exploiting those resources for the benefit of the masses, he was brutally assassinated. And the Congolese have not stopped the struggle. Uh, lately, in the 2015, we had the Telema uprising in DRC, where Congolese youth took upon themselves to challenge the status quo. And that spirit is still very vibrant. But I would be remiss not to mention, even though the spirit is vibrant, uh, we cannot forget that we still have a few reactionaries um, in the DRC who want to efface, uh, I'm, I'm saying efface, we, who wants to erase uh, the history, uh, the legacy of Patrice Lumumba. Uh, but it is hard to do uh, because Lumumba is not just in history books now. 
Lumumba is in our culture, in our songs, uh, that he say is, is going to be very hard to erase his legacy of what he stood for because it's not part of the public consciousness that we as Congolese, we must fight for the liberation of our land. In September 2020, Belgium announced that they would finally return his mortal remains, a tooth. This followed a major campaign by his daughter Juliana and from those fighting for justice around the world. His remains will finally be buried this year. But this does not mark an end to the story. Instead, it throws up many questions on the culpability of colonial powers and the impact of their crimes over the decades. When we talk even about the remains of Patrice Lumumba coming back uh, to the DRC, it's important to look at the historical trajectory of how we got there. You know, the remains coming back to DRC from Belgium, um, not in the DRC. So one may ask, how did he end up there? But we have to look at the struggle of the Congolese from the 40s to the 60s. Uh, during that process, young Congolese start mobilizing and organizing to end colonialism, particularly Belgian colonialism. And there were a few young Congolese who were impactful. Um, the ones that I'm speaking about are Patrice Lumumba, Joseph Ngalula, and uh, Gaston Diomi. These were the three young Congolese who were invited at the All African People's Conference that took place in Accra, uh, supported by uh, Ras Makonnen, who apparently bought the flights for them to come uh, to Accra. But as they came, they saw a group of young Africans determined to transform the continent. These young people said, we are being colonized on our land where we have our resources and we don't control them. And if we want to transform our lives, we must regain control of this land. And during that time in Accra, deals and connections and agreements were made among these young people stating that each one of us are going back to our home countries and we are going to mobilize for independence now, not tomorrow, not a few decades from now, that we needed independence so that we could get, regain control of our land and resources. As Patrice Lumumba went back to the DRC, he didn't go back alone. So that's why I always insist the independence of the Congo wasn't a Congolese affair. It was a Pan-African affair. You had Cameroonian, you had Chadian, you had Central Africans, you had Ghanaians who were working with the PSA, Parti Solidaire Africain, and the MNC, a Mouvement National Congolais Patrice Lumumba, they mobilized and organized, and in May of 1960, they shocked the world. Congolese, when they were given to their own, uh, given the space to choose their own leader, they chose a leader who embodied Pan-Africanism. They chose Patrice Lumumba. As he won the election of May 1960, right before uh, the Independence Day of June 30th, Western nations start getting worried. And the, the worry of the Western powers, particularly Belgium and the United States, was who's going to take control of Congo's economy? Who's going to take control of Congo's resources? So they were quick to give Congolese the political independence, but they refused to give Congolese control of their mineral resources, particularly Dwight Eisenhower, who needed Congo's uranium and Congo's cobalt back then during the so-called Cold War. So in July of 1960, uh, right after the declaration of independence in the DRC, can you imagine, the Congo became independent on June 30th, 1960. Patrice Lumumba gave one of the most impressive and fantastic speech, uh, Independence Day speech, written by André Blois, and that's something people do not know. Uh, she actually wrote that speech. As he read the speech about why it was important, one, for us to remember those who fought before and that what we fought for did not come as a gift, that we, had, we fought with blood and sweat and we gained independence and we are determined to continue to fight for a new Congo that would transform Africa. And from that speech on June 30th, a few weeks later, the United States President Dwight Eisenhower in the Secu in National Security Council minute, uh, meeting stated, that Patrice Lumumba should be eliminated. This is in the church committee, uh, the records that this order came from Dwight Eisenhower in July already. And the reason, as I mentioned a moment ago, was he did not want a young 35-year-old Congolese to have control of the land the size of Western Europe, 
bordered by nine African countries with so much wealth, some of them being strategic minerals that the United States wanted. So the plot to overthrow him happened a few weeks after he became uh, the prime minister of the DRC. So within weeks of Patrice Lumoa becoming the prime minister, he was deposed. Within months, he was assassinated with the help of Belgium, the United States, and uh, a few Congolese sycophants. But his killing is really important to know. And uh, Ludo De Witt says it best in his book, The Assassination of Lumumba. In his book, he, the introduction of the book is fascinating. He explains saying that when he started writing the book, he was surprised of how much information existed around the killing of Patrice Lumumba. But he was surprised that academics, intellectuals, and others did not want to dig into the information. And he concluded that the assassination of Lumumba was not just the physical assassination of Patrice Lumumba in the URC where the Congolese will not have a leader. What they did to his body was literally to make sure that Lumumba is erased from the collective memory of Africans. So how did they kill him? They arrest him, they torture him with two of his uh, comrades who were part of the government, um, Polo and Okito, torture the three of them, beat them completely to death, put them into firing squad, right? And bury them. After burying him, they knew that wherever Lumumba was buried for years and decades to come, it may become a place of pilgrimage for Congolese or for those who believe in the ideas of Patrice Lumumba. So they went back to where he was buried, took his body out, chopped it off into pieces, put it into acid, and burned it completely so that his remains will not be found anywhere. But the most bizarre thing that took place around this year, it was done by two Belgian mercenaries. One of them, in the early 2000s, participated in a documentary where he actually bragged about the killing of Patrice Lumumba, where he explained what they did to his body. And during the interview, he said that Congolese, sometimes they feel that Lumumba may resurrect one day. There are even people who believe he will return. Now he'll have to come back with two front teeth missing. <laughs> then he goes into his pocket, takes out a pouch, opens the pouch, and pulls a tooth out of the pouch and shows it to the camera, stating, that's Lumumba's tooth. Can you imagine the pain I and millions of Congolese feel to know that there was a Belgian mercenary who was walking around Belgium with Lumumba's tooth and actually bragging about the killing and showing it on camera. But when he did that, there was uprising in Belgium, riots. People were frustrated and saying, how can this be possible? So a few weeks later, the gentleman said, of course, I'm saying it for the sake of the interview that he's a gentleman. But the individual says that he uh, threw the tooth away. He, that he did not have it in his possession anymore. He passed away. He died. Then a, a few decades ago, his daughter does an interview also in Belgium, where she states that she also, uh, her father gave her the tooth. Riots, protests happen again, and then she says that she threw it away. Then surprisingly this year, after the official request of the Lumumba family by uh, Juliana Lumumba, the daughter of Patrice Lumumba, she made an official request to the Belgian government that she wants the remains of her father to be returned to the Congo. The Ministry of Justice, officially, the Belgian government responded to that request stating that they have his remains and they will return the remains of Patrice Lumumba. Can you imagine for 60 years, Belgium had Lumumba's tooth, Lumumba's remains, and they want to tell us that Congolese killed Patrice Lumumba. What is this tooth doing in Belgium? So that very small explanation clearly shows that there was an international attempt to not just kill Lumumba, but to stop the Pan-African movement which was successful 
again in 1960, 12 African nations became independent. And this wave was going through the African continent. So they wanted to make sure that they, one, make an example out of Patrice Lumumba, so that anyone who wants to rise up, they will say, look at what happened to Patrice Lumumba. Do you want that to happen to you? But what they didn't realize is what Patrice Lumumba was fighting, it wasn't fighting for him as an individual. There, there is a spirit of resistance in the DRC, in the Congolese people, to want to have a say in the decision-making process of our country. That no matter who is assassinated, the Rossi Chimanga, uh, the young Congolese who have passed away in the past decade, the Therese Kapangala, you know, she also passed away in the past protests around uh, Kabila being in power, the former president of the DRC. The spirit of resistance in the DRC is so entrenched in the people that it cannot go away. That's why I always say Patrice Lumumba is an ideal. That ideal is simple. We must take control of our land. We must take control of our resources. We must exploit those resources for the benefit of the Congolese people, not the multinationals in Paris, London, and uh, Washington. As Patrice Lumumba said, Africa will write its own history. It won't be the history written in Paris, Washington, or London. It will be the history written by Africans themselves. And that history will be of glory. And that's what the people of the Congo till today are taking from what happened to Patrice Lumumba and what we can do today to transform the Congo. Ой, убит герой твой мой.